Well, once again, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Otama. Um, yes, it is really here, and my head is really fuzzy, so I'll need much grace. <laughs> um, I'm thinking that I'm just going to start. I'm just, I don't know what I'm thinking, so I'm just going to talk. But anyway, I'm so grateful to have you all here. I didn't quite understand what I was doing, and um, and with Otoma. And so as I'm seeing all your names on here, it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is really exciting. And I'm I'm thrilled to share with you what it is that I've been involved with. And um, I don't know, I feel compelled after Otoma shared how old he is. <laughs> I'll share that, I, I'll tell you, I'll let you know that um, I'm, I'm almost 70, Earth date. And I share that because I just recently, I feel like I just recently landed in this place that I am in sharing presencing with people and also the spiritual direction. And um, so it's never too late to try to start something new and, and just follow your passions. And so with presencing, I'm assuming you've all read the chapter that I did on spiritual or on um, presencing. Um, but I'll give you, so I'll just give you a really light overview. Um, the word presencing comes from um, Otto Scharmer's idea of being present to each other as we mm -hmm. are now. And then um, also being able to sense what is going on. Like when you walk into a room, you have a feeling that this room has got some positive energy in it, or you're or you're aware that your body is hungry and you really want to get the meeting over or whatever. Those are all sensations that have um, that I really believe God uses to help us um, be sensitive to one another in our listening. And listening is really important to me because I just think in this world, we really um, we have so many things going on in our minds that we don't really hear each other. And so I hope from this process. Um, that you will have a good idea of some listening skills that you can take with you and that you can implement this process in the work that you are doing. And it takes practice. I've been doing this probably for the past, it seems like maybe eight years. And, um, and so I prefer to do it like face to face, but I'm so excited to think that we can do it in this capacity as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what I was, what I'd like to do is just open us up with a, a short prayer and we'll start to move into the process a little bit. Does anyone have any questions at the moment? Nope. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and start us in a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together, the opportunity to um, learn and to grow and to allow your spirit to work. I love this process of presencing because I really believe that it gives us an access to point to the spirit where we can be more attentive to you and one another. God, I pray that you will bless this um, experience and Father, please help me to um, share it with all of these wonderful uh, disciples in, in a way that is clear for them and provides a good example for how they can take that into the future. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thanks. That's awesome. I, it's just, I'm amazed who, I'm amazed at all of you on here. Thank you for so much for your interest. So what I'm wondering is if it would work to have the, um, this is kind of a practical. I'm wondering if those of you who are compassionate listeners and case givers, so Gwen, you're the case giver, is that right? Awesome, thank you. You can take, like block your camera on your Zoom, you'll still be able to see us, right? And so that way I know who I'm working with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would that work? Okay. And, um, you're always welcome to pop back in or raise your hand or something. I know Tama can help you with that. Um, so, so what the process is, is where we have a case giver or somebody who wants to share their story. And Gwen will be doing that today. 
I'm trying to keep um, be aware of the time. So it's going to be very fast. And normally it's a 70 minute experience about. And um, so I will be cruising through this pretty quickly. And then to the, uh, the compassionate listeners, I, what I have four of them, I think you said, Otama. So you will all be listening. And then all the others, you also are compassionate listeners, but you will not be participating, you will be observing. Although, please, please make the assumption that you could be in the role of a compassionate listener. And so um, staying really attentive and, and being able to listen deeply will be a really important piece for you. Um, Okay, so if you would like to just go ahead, please, and close your cameras down, unless you're going to be an active member of this exercise, we'll get started before we run out of time. So I also teach this as we go, which is why I'm not doing a lot of explaining right now. And um, so, Gwen is going to share with us, sorry, I'm looking at my paper, um, is going to share with us her current situation, her intention and learning, um, what she really wants to learn and then what can we help with. And the important thing about being um, a compassionate listener here is that we give Gwen our undivided attention. It's without judgment, it's without preconceived notions or any scenarios we would build up in our minds. We are not trying to fix Gwen, we're not trying to give her advice. And we are um, in service to her very respectfully. And so we listen. There will be a moment that we can ask some clarifying questions. And again, I apologize, but this is going to be a very fast experience. So Gwen, thank you so much. You're welcome to share with us what it is you'd like to, to work on. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just so, Everyone knows this is a scenario that is just a scenario I'm putting out here. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is I'm a, a single mom. I've been uh, divorced for over the past five years, and I have three teenage children, two boys and a daughter. Um, the problem is that when I have my children with me, I bring them up in the church. They're there every Sunday. They're going to Sunday school. They're participating in everything and learning about God. When they go over to see their father, he always talks down about the church and tell them things that they're learning aren't true. And basically that there is no God. So now my boys are kind of struggling because, you know, they're very close to their dad and they tend to believe everything he says. So it's kind of a struggle going back and forth. I've tried to reason with him and talk to him and let him know that this isn't helping the children. And he knows he knows better himself because he was raised in the church, but it's a specific incident happened to where he no longer wants to connect with the church at all. So I'm struggling with what do I do? I'm trying to get my boys mentors, but even that isn't working. And they've known other disciples in the church since they were little boys growing up, but they still tend to fight against that. Now, my daughter, she clings on to what she's learning, but she also cries a lot. So it's still trying to, you know, keep the family together, not alienate them, you know, from their dad and also not put him down when they're in my presence to try to explain to them that God is very much real and, you know, keeping God in their lives and trying to raise them where they'll grow up and want to become disciples one day. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I was curious, how old are the boys they are 16 and 17 now. And your daughter? She's 14. Okay. Does anyone else want to ask Gwen a question, kind of clarifying question? I, I do have one question. So you mentioned that your ex-husband was part of the church before? Yes. That's right. What is it that we can help you with, Gwen? I'm just, well, of course, I'm constantly praying and I'm talking to other members, you know, in the church. 
you know, I belong to a group of women who have, you know, ex-spouses or spouses who are not disciples. And I'm still not managing to be able to break through to the kids. And mainly it's because of what their dad is telling them, especially, like I said, with the boys. And at the same time, comforting, you know, my daughter, because she's torn. She's torn between what dad is saying, what mom is saying, although she still believes there is a God, she still sometimes she says things like, well, I don't really know if God is real. If something happens and she thinks it's bad, why would God let that happen? Thank you. Yes. Does anyone else have a question? Um, I do. I do. This is Scotty. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question is, have you talked to your ex-husband and conveyed to him how unhealthy um, his perspective is and, and, and given his perspective to the children like that? All the time. Because we do have an open relationship where we communicate all the time, but he's convinced that it isn't them at all. Okay, so again, like I mentioned, this is a fast process. Thank you, Gwen, for sharing. Um, the thought that I, you know, I had one last thought. I wondered if you, um, what you feel you need to let go of so that you can move forward in this process. Is there? Well, that's, you know, what I'm trying to feel is what is, what should I let go of? How can I reach my kids? Thank you. Because one day I know I may not be here to try to continue to guide them as they continue to grow up. Okay. It is Thank that you, you have one one daughter and two two boys? Yes. How, how old are your sons? 16 and 17. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm we, we'll need to now move into um Keep in mind Gwen's story, because now what we're going to do is we're going to move into a moment of silence. I'm going to go ahead and hold the silence. Typically what you do is you, in this process that we're talking about, what you do is you have three minutes of silence, which can feel like an eternity. But in that silence, which is really critical to this process, you have an opportunity to think of an image, a metaphor, um, something that kind of Gwen's story com makes, uh, comes up for you. And um, so let's enter into some silence and I will keep track of the time and then we'll come back. So we'll start now. Okay, we'll go ahead and come back. Uh, <clears throat> when you do that, it usually lasts longer and therefore you have more time to consider Gwen's story. So what I would like to share, what came up for me, Gwen, is just this feeling of um, almost like chess players on a board where you've got the little pawns and all those different things and you, everybody's kind of like in their spot and trying to figure out which direction to go before it affects the other direction. It's almost like each individual has a capacity to affect the other, um, but that it's kind of a, yeah, kind of, I don't know. I don't play chess much, so I don't much have many words, but anyway, you get the idea. Any of the other um, compassionate listeners, do you have something that came up for you about Gwen's story? Actually, I did. Um, I was wondering if, well, considering the fact that 
um, she has a very good open uh, dialogue with her ex-husband. That in fact is good um, because they can continue to talk about the children and their well-being. That being said, um, based on what I've heard, I do believe that the father cares about his children um, because you know he's spending time with them, he's talking with them, things like that. Um, but the conversation is kind of throwing the kids into a state of confusion. And I was wondering, um, Gwen, if you've ever, um, if you've had the conversation with him about the confusion that it causes for the kids, as opposed to letting them decide because they're in an age where they can make up their own minds about how they feel about God and just allow them to do that. If they're exposed to church um, and they decide they're not ready, that's one thing. But if they are exposed to church and then they have their father whom they love saying things that are negative against the church that could cause some problems for the children, so what I was thinking in this is the, um, the agreement between the parents to let the children decide where they are before God. Well, we, he doesn't really talk about that because of his feelings, even though I've expressed to him what it does. And the fact is too, by especially the boys being older, you know, like if necessarily maybe impacting even some of the other children at the church that they, you know, their friends that they may come in contact with, with some of the things. Mm -hmm. that so he, says, oh, okay. he kind of avoids that particular conversation. Mm. Yeah. I, Cause as I said, there was a situation that happened at the church and it made him very bitter when he left the church. Mm. But it's kind of a little bit evasive about that, even though I do tell him about how they feel and I don't put any pressure on them. They still go, mm -hmm. but I don't say you have to do this or you have to do that. Thank you. I, does anyone, do any of the other compassionate listeners have something that they wanted to contribute? Um, I, an image, I, I, and when I ask for a contra contribution, I'm looking for an image that maybe came that could be helpful to Gwen or that it could be, um, you know, like for me, I'd share the, the chess board. Did anyone else have like something that they could share with Gwen? I, I, I also, I have a question. I'm thinking about like, um, not a, but just like having a, a family time where you play certain type of games just to see where they are at as far as even trying to get mentoring for that. They do have mentors. Okay. Yeah, I said they, they do have mentors in the church. The people who've been disciples that have known them since they were babies. So they do have mentors and they spend, and, time, they spend time with them. Okay. And how about you as um, like, as a mom, like how do you feel like as far as your relationship you said with them are and just really continue to um, like what are some of the things you continue to do in the home to just make sure that you are living so the life that shine for God so they can continue to just see that in you and let them know you still you know, see your love for them, even though they are going down a different part and your prayer time and stuff. Well, we do have our Bible studies in the home a few days out of the week. We pray together when we sit down, you know, just prayer. We also have time when we get ready to eat. We also pray, you know, we, they hear me praying in the morning when they're up, we pray in the car, you know, when I'm taking to school before, you know, leave the house and everything. So. Also, I do have some of the sisters that, you know, I have that support me and my disciples. They are over to the house. So they are very much in the environment, but it's just that they are clinging to 
dad because of their relationship with dad. Not that they're not against me, but they just love dad so much. It's just that they're falling into believing what dad is telling them, possibly because they are young men following the path of dad going up to become a man. Mm -hmm. I'm, thank you. Um, because of the time, I'm going to kind of bring some t a teaching element into this discussion. Um, it is nearly impossible to give a really true view of what it is this process can do if you're in a small group and working together. So if I say something that maybe makes you aff feel offended, please, please know that it's really more the constraints that we have in the exercise. But with, um, so what I see is happening um, is that Gwen has shared her story. She's concerned about her boys and her daughter. We all can see that and the feedback that we've given her is similar to that. What we have to be, okay, so some of that would have come out in the beginning when we had gave her the opportunity to share her story. So there's, the questioning will happen a little bit more in the story. And then what happens is when we have that period of silence, it's not a time to kind of think of solutions or, you know, it's really a time to think about Gwen. What picture do you have in your mind of what it is that Gwen shared? Not so much what you think your experiences are. Um, we've, la we've kind of lapsed into, and I understand why, into more questions. And so what we want to do is really just kind of stay really tight to what Gwen has shared. And it's not a time for further clarification when we come back in after the silence. So the silence is typically very powerful. And that's why I say, please stay to the three minutes when you're doing this together um, or listening to somebody. Don't be afraid to bring silence into it. It doesn't have to be a long period of silence, but silence gives people a chance to organize. Now, what I did notice that is Gwen was receiving further questions and clarification. Her, your, Gwen, I noticed your voice started to come up and I don't know if you were starting to feel anxious, but I did notice that you were like, okay. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm kind of like feeling under the pressure here is what the feeling was that I got. Is that what you started to feel? Yes, because actually for me, I'm normally like you, I'm on the other side. So I was telling the Tom, it's kind of nice to be on the side of kind of being, you know, like the client or person that you're talking to, because I coach. And I was just kind of putting some things in there that I've experienced from people that I coach, how their feelings, you know, might be and, you know, different things. So, yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I mean by listening is like, I heard, I heard Gwen's voice come up. And then I'm able to like check in with her to see where she is in getting a lot of input or a lot of questions. So sometimes people can feel sort of interrogated and we want to prevent that. We're listening and we're not trying to solve their problems. We're not trying to give them advice as we are trying to ask our question. I hope that makes sense, but it's really important to this process. And so I'm spending the time on it that I am. So what we would then do is go from the, so the mirroring, um, let me read that again. So after the stillness, um, the mirroring is that we have, um, we have an open mind, we have um, open heart, and an open will, which means we're just totally open to the process that is being revealed to us. And we are without judgment. So I've said that probably a few times. And so, uh, and then we go into like talking and giving um, Gwen a chance to share back with us kind of what our input meant to her or what she saw through our input. And then we would move into um, some closing remarks. So the generative discussion piece of it follows um, that time of mirroring as you see through those steps that you have. And then that period gives, um, gives us time to just maybe give a little bit more of a reflection rather than um, asking more clarifying questions. So, so like I said, this is like, um, 
you know, we're doing this like in warp speed, but if you were together, it, it can potentially be 70 minutes to follow through all of the steps that are available to you in what I wrote. So, um, and then you would move into closing remarks. And that's where we were just like, Gwen, thank you so much for, you know, putting yourself out there and giving us a chance to really hear your story. And um, thank you too, to the case givers or the um, compassionate listeners. Um, you brought some really interesting things to the table and I think I'm sure you've given Gwen plenty of things to think about. So thank you so much. And so we want to be able to do that to close out. And then um, none of this is open to discussion. It's done. If Gwen wanted to bring it up, then she can bring it up with the individuals she wants to, but is not open for discussion. This whole process, when you do it with an individual, is completely confidential, um, unless it had something to do with self-harm or whatever, and then you kind of have to, don't even go there right now, but um, but it's, it's really important, again, to be in service to the individual who we are listening to, and that the silence provides an opportunity for us to reorganize our thoughts, to allow any images come up. And I believe in that silence, God speaks to us. We did not feel that as much today um, because of the speed that we're doing this. But at the same time, it's really, really a fruitful thing to do in any conversation is to allow places for silence. So that should wrap it up. Um, Otomo, what do you think? Everybody can come back now if you like. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, what may be helpful is maybe to share about how you came to uh, see the importance of this technique um, in your life, if you will. And then also, I think what was very helpful, what I noted, uh, because we may not necessarily always go through this to the level that you've stated, but I think the principle is very helpful as far mm -hmm. as listening deeply with the different levels, whether it's downloading, factual, uh, empathic and generative from the the story of the the um, Samaritan woman. I think maybe covering that may be helpful. Um, so maybe I guess we'll just start with those two couple things. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you. Um, what I how did I get to this? I I decided to go back to school and get a master's degree. And when I did that, I um, I went for, I my master's is in organizational leadership, but within that, I concentrated on servant leadership. And then within that, I um, had an instructor who had really developed this process. This process is, like I say, develop you know was developed also at MIT for their Presencing Institute. And I really felt a very spiritual connection to it. When you really get into one of these kinds of um, processes, it's like, oh my gosh, you, you had the same feeling I had. You said the same thing I was thinking. And then you start seeing some connections and it's like, we didn't plan this. <laughs> we didn't even talk. This is what came to the surface for us in this experience. And I started seeing that this was just an amazing place for God to work. And, um, and so I, I decided to, um, through Shane, you know, Shane and I kind of worked on this together, but um, it was probably it was something that I really had wanted to do is bring it to the church. And so the way I was able to do that is to bring it into a more spiritual perspective, which is hard to convey right now because we it's a process. It's not like, oh, let's go to that scripture. We're going to find it there. But if you look at the examples that I provided in the book, you'll see that Jesus really was in, he was very present to the people that he talked to. He knew exactly um he knew their hearts because he listened to them. And what was the other question, Atama? Yeah, the other, oh, the the other one. Levels. Yeah. <laughs> so the levels of listening are um, um, downloading. That downloading piece of it is like what I'm doing. I'm downloading a whole lot of information to all of you. It's all very superficial. It doesn't necessarily change you or me. And it's very often, you know, you're in fellowship and you find yourself sort of just downloading because you're trying to catch up with everybody and they're sharing their day with you. And, you know, it's all important, but 
it's the deeper levels of communication where we really start to understand one another. And so um, the next level that goes that comes down is kind of what what does it say in the book? I forget what I word what word did I use? Uh, factual. Factual, yes. So again, I'm also sharing factual information as I'm just downloading. And so that factual information is something that is you know the details of that, they know the details of that, but you might be getting some new information that changes maybe the information that you hold. And those are just like, those you will find in nearly every conversation. But then when you get down to the empathy, um, where we really can be present with somebody, that's where the conversation really starts to deepen. But that doesn't mean that you take on their story, nor do you necessarily um, contribute your story because your story is not their story and respecting their story is where I, is what I'm referring to when I say be in service to somebody. It doesn't become your story and it's not influenced by your story. It needs to be something that you can be hold space just like you're holding them in the palm of your hands. And then the generative dialogue that you get into is the deepest form of communication. And that's what I, and what that means is that it is constructive communication. It is creative communication. It's done collectively very often. And that may just be you and one other person. But it's a place where you like start to get your insights to you start to really be able to um, have your aha moments in it. And it, it can lead to other things. And in regard to that, I would say we are, we are in a process here. We've just done some work with Gwen and her story, but Gwen's work only begins here. So this is just like opening a, a, like opening a door for Gwen to consider some new perspectives. And those perspectives are the insights that she gained that God brought into, into her awareness and perhaps through us, but perhaps not. And so we don't even always understand what it is that somebody is, is gaining by this process. We have to trust that and let it be. And that's where generative dialogue comes in. Yeah, and I think in the book you have, um, again, using the example of the Samaritan woman, downloading was uh, the Samaritan woman saying, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. That's just, that's just it is what it is. Then mm -hmm. factual, sir, you have nothing to draw with this in the water. So that's factual. Empathic was, um, you are right when you say, I have no husband. So it's getting deeper. And then the last one is looking at future possibilities, which is generative. A time is coming when, when, when you will worship the Father, um, you know. And so there's some hope that's kind of noted there. So I think for me, when I went through even the presentation that you sent before today's session, it just got me thinking where I should be most of the time and in what relationships I should be generative versus empathic i don't know if there's any guidance you can provide on where we should be most of the time and then maybe what relationships we should be at each of these levels that's a great question i think that any conversation encompasses all of them i feel like we move through them um in some sense i would say they they one cannot do without the other um, but if somebody is talking to you, for instance, about having cancer, you're going to immediately go to empathy and, and generative. It's like, what can I, you know, what can be done to make this journey, um, more fruitful for you? What? What it, how can you come into your higher self, for example, um, though you are facing this? So it, 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 just by the nature of it, it just, you do a deep dive down all of those. But then, the, so for example, if somebody just found out that they have cancer 
and I'm sorry this if I'm pulling any triggers here, but it's it helps you to see the um, the depth of it is um, you know the first part is like the the person has they've just found out they have cancer. So you're going to stay very superficial. They're just learning themselves and you have to respect that they're going to come into greater awarenesses as they drop down through, through that dialogue. What in Sharmer's work, what he does with those levels of listening is to just, he encourages people to really just start paying attention. Is this, as I'm talking to this person, am I, in a downloading mode. And then, so it's really kind of a, kind of like a checklist of like learning what your own level is as you're talking with that person. I feel like I'm stumbling around, but um, so essentially you're paying attention to your, your mode of listening. And if you're staying too much up into the, um, the uh boy my brain's checking out the first two factual and downloading <laughs> downloading yes thank you um if you're sitting up there too much you're not going to get to know that person very well mm -hmm. and also like i don't know if any of you probably have experienced this where you're in fellowship mm -hmm. and somebody go there go there you, <laughs> yeah what no, I'm saying go there. I think this is okay. relevant. All right. So if you're in fellowship, you have that one person that for whatever reason, you don't know why you can't really talk with them. They kind of wear you thin a little bit, but you don't really know why. And you don't, you walk away from that experience and you feel sort of drained, but you also really don't know what it is you're expected to do or not do and and you you go off and talk to somebody that you have a, a perhaps a deeper connection with because it, so this person that you first talked to is like you just don't know who they are it's like who are they <laughs> they just gave me all this information but i don't feel like i know them well what's probably happening is that that individual is more comfortable in those upper stages of communication but the person you go seek out is the person's like oh man we have great talks it's like we be we're able to sit down together and we are able to just really have a deep talk about god those are the ones that are probably already down to the um, empathy and generative where you've shared your life with each other and um, it's mutual and you feel like you're really, um, you leave those feeling energized. Sometimes you feel fatigued, but you're still energized. And so that's what I mean by paying attention to the various levels of listening, because if you are aware of your own level of listening and your own tendencies in communication, then you have more um more information to how to deepen your own your own contributions in conversations mm -hmm. because we all want to live on a deeper level what uh, sorry what time go ahead this also may be why we could we become very close to people in our bible talk and we know them after many years but one bible talk over and it's like i don't really know them that well <laughs> because we've <laughs> because we've reverted to the higher level you know the factual uh way of communication rather than going into the generative on a more regular basis, which I'm sure is a lot more emotionally taxing, you know? So, uh, Sandra, they're you wanted to go ahead. They're, they're differently taxing. I would say, um, one is energizing another is draining, but remember we use all of them in any one conversation. Mm -hmm. It's just where we choose to, to stay and, and, um, we have to allow ourselves to be able to move through all four levels of communication if we want to build deep relationships. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have uh, Sandra share, and then uh, Titi is a uh, very wise woman from the South. So I'm sure she has some uh, very insightful things to share with us. Guys, you got to watch out, not to put her on the spot, but she is a wise woman. Uh, Sandra, you want to share? Yeah, I had a question um, as we were going through those steps. Does, are those those listening levels are not the same as the steps you went through? Is that right? 
They are aspects of, they're, they're folded in, although in the process, they're not stated. And so we're looking at two different things, but okay. they mutually inform. So do you have, can I ask a question? So in those conversations that are draining, like, and, and I know I can be like this as well, so it's not like I'm exempt, but when, when someone is kind of fixated on a particular problem or they like tell the same stories over and over, like that's very draining to me. And, um, you know, just focusing on what I can do on myself, how can I be a better listener in those situations so that I don't walk away, like you said, just drained? Like, how can I, how can I somehow change my perspective when listening to those kind of conversations so that I can be more present to that other person instead of like, oh gosh, this is the same thing. I don't want to hear. It. I mean, I'm just being honest here. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's also a really great example. Um, when, I mean, there are those people that that's just how they communicate. And it's not really up to us to change that or to fix them. But one suggestion I- my perspective. Yeah, no, I understand. And we can all probably be draining to somebody. But um, what I would say to that is that find some open-ended questions that you can ask them for, or check in with them. It's like, you know, I've heard this story yeah. a few times. Is there something more that you want to say about it? Is there something deeper that brings this story to your mind whenever we talk? Um it's kind of like the way I did with Gwen, where I checked in with her. It's like, hmm, yeah. I noticed yeah. your voice went up. So look, it's like, it's looking for the common threads and then asking open-ended questions to help move that into a deeper dialogue. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Oh man, CD, are you still here? I, I'm missing you. Okay, she may have had to jump. Um, Jorge, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> you on mute? Oh, I was talking to myself. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Diana, uh, very much for the chapter, and thank you for the for the experience of of of, of today. It was amazing. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is. Is it allowed to kind of control the situation when someone is kind of deviating from the uh, may what well, when in in one of the stages of the process? So, for example, if if it's it's not part of the process to start giving advices, is is someone kind of allowed to a uh, come back, come back? That that's that's just not what we're doing here right now. So, is 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 that okay, or it's just like okay, leave the person talk? And then at the end of the process, we receive kind of feedback to each other or something like that, or what would be the best approach in there. And the second question is, 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 it, is it better to do it with your closest friends or is a process that can be uh, experienced by, I mean, if, if you know a person and maybe you can get more of, or if you know that you can get very good insights from that person is it okay to be there or is it something that must be experienced within your closest circle thank you for asking those questions Jorge I would say um you know if so, if a conversation just seems like it's just kind of going nowhere or if it's a conversation that you know I, I don't want to suggest that we just let it become more random because that can be just that cannot be destructive to the relationship in some sense. Um, but we don't have to control it either. That's where the open-ended questions can be helpful. And then to speak to your second one and this first one, an example that I would give is that there's a sister that I have known for years and I find it difficult to talk to her partly because I have a hard time understanding her, her 
um, the way she uses her words. And, um, and then I also know that for myself, it's hard to separate from the background. And so I don't feel like I can really listen. And for years, I just kind of like, you know, I just would not engage in deep conversations with her when I was at church, not because I didn't like her. It's because I just struggled so hard to understand her. And one day it's like, oh, you know, I really want to be available to you. Can we meet for coffee? And it was such a difference because then I was able to um, give her my undivided attention and genuinely hear what it was she was trying to share with me. And so I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but if a, if a conversation is really deteriorating, it's okay to say, you know, let's just take a moment to be quiet together. Let's, you know, maybe we can just pray to ourselves together for a moment. And just that silence is, I can't emphasize it enough. It's just that moment of taking a deep breath. And sometimes, I mean, talk about the de-escalating a community, de-escalating a meeting. Imagine everybody, all right, we're going to enter into a period of silence where people can come down out of their emotions. And then when you come back to it, the emotions are more settled and the conversation can continue. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a really big example, but it's something that can be done also in one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I know it looks like CD's back. So if you wanted to say, share anything, CD, uh, you're open to. If not, we'll move on to Kathy. So not to put you on the spot too much, but just giving you an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thanks, Otoma. I, I, I appreciate, I'm just trying to, cause I was not here last week when I think you were starting, but I'm just trying to connect uh, when you refer to the book, which book specifically you're referring to, but I'll just not talk to the book or what other people may have read. Uh, like when I'm also, I'm a coach. So I'm just going to speak from that perspective in terms of listening. Will that be all right? Yes. Okay. So as I'm, as I'm listening to Diana speak and to other people, I think one of the things that you need to be very sensitive to a uh, journey of the soul, that's Dr. Soman's book. Okay, thank you. Um, what you need to be careful of is our emotions mm -hmm. lead to certain actions. For example, if somebody is speaking and I'm not listening to them, but I'm holding my story and I'm trying to make their story, it will elicit certain emotions from me and the chances are I'm going to respond based to those emotions because they predispose us to action, all of us, which then makes it very important for me to realize that their story is their story, not my story. Mm -hmm. The way I can hold them legitimate, in other words, to hold them with dignity and respect is to listen to what they are saying and not try to be the holder of their truth because I don't hold their truth. And I think a lot of the times in the church, I visited the US a couple of times, uh, although I'm in South Africa, but what I pick up is a lot of the times we come prepared. Sometimes we even prepare answers to people's and scriptures to people's situations. That pre-preparation already closes us up to listening. Because we almost like coming in with an answer as opposed to just listening to them and listening to their story and maybe allowing them percent of the time. Because I tell you what, when somebody comes to you, the answer is in them and you want them to own mm -hmm. that answer. You don't want them to go away saying that Diana advised me or Diana said I should. You want to, you are helping them as Gwen would agree as when we coach, we're helping people to elicit the answer that is within them, as opposed to them taking our answer. And when they go away, they own that. So it's to actually implement it. And understanding that everybody, all of us, yes, we, we got baptized, became disciples, our sins were forgiven, <laughs> and we are a new creation. But it does not change the fact that we've got our own backgrounds, We've got our own history. We've got our own cultures and experiences. And that's where we're listening from. So it doesn't mean that the day that I went under the waters of baptism, 
my history, my experiences, everything was washed away. My sins were washed away, yes. But my history, my culture, and everything else remains me. The reason why you should work with me with, in, with empathy is because you're trying to solicit where am I listening from. In coaching, we call it listening to your own listening. Because I've got my own listening as well, but also listening to the listening of the other person. Where are they coming from? And the way we're able to speak to others effectively is when we speak to their listening, when we speak to where they're coming from. But it's not for me to tell you the answer. It's not for me to tell you what to do. We all have the Holy Spirit and we've all been baptized. It's for me to help you when Satan is taking away that ability from you to elicit and think for yourself. It's for me to help you remove the things that may be closing you to your answer and not my answer. So mm -hmm. when you've got into the answer, you walk away thinking that, wow, I've got this, not wow. See, I did this for me. And that is where effective listening is powerful. Mm -hmm. That comes yeah. with empathy, not sympathizing, not actually, not actually taking on everything, mm -hmm. but empathizing and working with the people and using what you call in coaching, yes, and, or yes, or, or, or and both both end. So you're taking what they have as their solution and working around it to see for them to elicit who's going to help them to be effective. That's, that would be my contribution. I could, I could talk more to that, but I'm just respecting <laughs> the time and the fact that I'm just adding on what has been spoken about on this platform. No, that's why I wanted you to be able to share. You, you definitely <laughs> always uh, bring some Southern wisdom, as we would say, uh, Southern, Southern wisdom. So I definitely, definitely appreciate that. And uh, Diana may speak to this, I don't know, time-wise, but I think that's kind of like the whole point of this uh, exercise is to not really just speak, but to really get the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it does mention that in the chapter, which I know you, you did obviously have a chance to read, uh, TD, but that is kind of, and I think that, not to speak for Diana, but I think that's maybe why she's also excited about this uh, teaching. So I don't you want to share something real quick, uh, Diana, and then we'll close out with Catherine. Well, I really appreciate Chidi's input. Um, it, it's, I think, another way to say what it was I've been trying to convey here. And I love the, uh, the, uh, the point that the Holy Spirit is within each of us. And that's, if nothing else, we are listening is being in service to the Holy Spirit as that Holy Spirit prompts the individual to come into greater awarenesses and their future highest self and it we have to be out of get ourselves out of the way to allow that to happen um but we also in our promptings of the spirit have the opportunity to be in service to that individual in a way that maybe somebody else might not have been able to be used and so it's it's the ability to the need to communicate um with individuals leading with the skill of listening is exhausting as you first start to come, become aware of it. And, but however, it will bear much fruit. I'm confident of that through my own experiences. And again, giving a space in any conversation for God to work through the silence, through just taking a deep breath together. It doesn't mean that you have to pray together. It means that you are in silence together, which is being present to God. And so um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to our attention and bringing it out of the dusty holes of 1400 years uh, from since the 14th, 15th century. Uh, you want to close this out for us real quick, uh, Catherine, uh, very briefly. And then uh, if you can also say a word of prayer as we wrap it up, Kathy. Oh, uh, yeah. And I, I had a question. So I guess I'm going to have to ask that question of God as to how it is that you get unstuck from when, when Gwen told her story and it wasn't even uh, a real story. The image that I had, I'm still stuck with. And and how do you take yourself out of that and disconnect from from what you connect it with, like with the person, like wondering and like thinking and like being there in that moment that you got into? How do you get out of it? Okay. <laughs> 
So, so then I'm going to uh, go into prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, God, for, for this moment, for, uh, for the teaching. Thank you, Lord, for a, a, the group of people that just comes to you first, for a group of people that, uh, for disciples that come to you for knowledge, that come to you for replenishment, Lord. Thank you for the relationships. And uh, for this time today, I pray, Lord, that this time that we take away from it and keep it with us in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Kathy, I was showing the book for Tzidi, so don't think I was answering your question with the book. So that wasn't my point. But uh, I think we are <laughs> going to we are going to uh, wrap it up at this point. Again, uh, thank you so much, Diana, for waking up at oh dark 30 hours literally yes uh, alaska time uh not so much td it's two o'clock there so you know that sacrifice was not so great but <laughs> nonetheless we appreciate the wisdom that you were able to bring all the way from robin island um i think keenan keenan uh keenan has one last word but i know he's a very brief and awesome brother so he's he's gonna Stick to, he's gonna. He's not gonna ruin his reputation today. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to uh, follow up on uh, Jorge's point. What is the most optimum number of people to to do this practice with? Mm. Four. Four. Okay. Thank okay. you. But it can be done in any conversation once you get a handle on it. Okay. Oh man. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for the time. We are going to uh, obviously resume next Sunday. And uh, Lachelle Pope is going to be directing our thoughts on Lectio Divina. Uh, the word becomes life. I think Diane will probably be uh, sleeping in that day, so she may not be with us. But if she feels the urge and she has a sleepless night, who knows? We may see her. <laughs> Possibly. Where's the recording? <laughs> I will uh, I will send you guys the recordings. Those that requested the last recording, I'll send it to you. And then I'll also send uh, this 